Welcome. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. All our virtual programs are free of charge. Your support makes our work possible. Thank you. Today, I'm excited and honored to introduce two speakers. Sasha Davis is the executive director of the René and Chaim Gross Foundation, the historic home and studio of American sculptor Chaim Gross in New York City. She is responsible for the foundation's operations, strategy, curatorial vision and programming. Davis was appointed executive director in 2017 after serving as curator of collections. Prior to her work at the foundation, Davis held internships at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA PS1 and the New York Museum. Davis holds a BA from New York University in art history with a minor in studio art and a certificate in arts administration and collections management, also from New York University. Davis regularly presents on the foundation's collection and the work of Gross, notably at the College Art Association, Southeastern College Arts Conference and Provincetown Art Association and Museum. She has contributed to the Aspen Institute's Artist Endowed Foundation Initiative and completed the seminar on strategy for artist endowed foundation leaders in 2018 with the Aspen Institute and University of Miami School of Law. She's also an alumna of the distinguished 2016 Ettingham Summer School. Mimi Gross is a painter as well as a set and costume designer and maker of interior and exterior installation. She has lived and worked in Tribeca for the last 40 years and is known especially for her portraiture, portraiture and for working with oil crayon and shark pastel in addition to oil paint. Gross considers port portraiture a form of mutual, mutual, mutual collaboration. Her paintings have a poignant expressiveness on connection to the subject. Hers is a world of bold, uh, unapologetic color. The directness of Gross's portraiture and her propensity to paint all aspects of her community can be linked in particular to the work of Alice Neal, who was a close friend. Gross's work can be found in the collections of the Jewish Museum New York, the New York Public Library, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York. Gross grew up in South Harlem in Manhattan. Her father was Chaim Gross. We'll now first hear from Sasha about Chaim Gross and the foundation started by him. This talk will be followed by a conversation with daughter Mimi Gross. At the end of today's event, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions. Welcome, Sasha and Mimi. Wonderful, thank you so much for having us, Rachel. Um, I just want to say it's been a pleasure to follow along with your work at the First Asher Society. Um, I think it's really important and we're honored to be here today. And also a thank you to my colleague Brittany Cassandra who helped put together the film we're about to watch. Chaim Gross's legacy is defined by a commitment to his work as a sculptor, a lifelong collector, and a dedicated teacher. During his lifetime, he and wife Rini envisioned a private foundation that would provide education and aesthetic enrichment by preserving his studio and their home at 526 LaGuardia Place in Greenwich Village, New York City. My name is Sasha Davis, and I am the executive director of the Rini and Chaim Gross Foundation. In this short film, we will utilize the archives, collection, and historic home and studio at the foundation in order to share the life, work, and legacy of Chaim Gross. Gross's life experiences, especially the traumatic events that occurred during his childhood in Europe, and his struggles as a young artist in the United States, 
helped to shape his philanthropic vision and determination to espouse joy in his work. Gross worked in a variety of mediums, but is best known for his sculpture in wood. He also worked in stone and bronze, drew copiously from his life and imagination, and made prints, primarily lithographs. Gross favored depictions of circus performers, dancers, and intimate pairings of mothers with children. His style combined modernist African and folk forms, and he pulled from his extensive knowledge of global art history. This is the first floor gallery and studio where Gross worked for 28 years. The sculpture studio displays Gross's tools, materials, and finished works from the mid-1920s to works in progress left in place after his passing in 1991. Gross designed the studio in collaboration with two modernist architects, Arthur Malson and Don Ryman. Their early 1960s renovations included the addition of the large skylight, double height studio space, and end grain flooring. In 2017 and 2018, supported by the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the foundation restored the skylight back to its original appearance, which floods the workspace with light. Although not known as a portraitist, Gross completed a number of portraits, often working in bronze. The selection on this shelf includes portrayals of actor Anthony Quinn, daughter Mimi Gross as a child, granddaughter Saskia Grooms as a child, Yiddish actor and founder of the Vilna Troupe Elite Kadison, and Chaim Weitzman, first president of Israel, whose bus sits next to his wife Vera's. Gross was born in 1902, the tenth child born to his parents, Leah Sperber and Moisha Gross, in an area called Galicia that was at the time part of eastern Austria-Hungary, but now Ukraine. Although Gross was the tenth born, only five children made it to adulthood due to illness. This photo captures four of the five children, Abraham, Sarah, Chaim, and Pincus. Elder brother Naftoli had already immigrated to the U.S. Moisha was a timber appraiser, and Chaim Gross grew up surrounded by the woods of the Carpathian Mountains. Many links are made between Gross's early childhood and his eventual direction as an artist. The focus on family, acrobats from the circus, and the love of wood carving. In 1911, the Gross family relocated from the small village of Volova to the nearby town of Kalamea. Three years later, at the beginning of World War I, Russian forces invaded the area. The Russian Imperial Army ceded control from the infantry to a cavalry of Cossack soldiers, and they were given free reign. Gross witnessed a brutal attack on his parents in their home, the Cossack soldiers armed with sabers. Amazingly, they survived the ordeal. Following this, the area around Kalamea was the site of intense action, with the Austrians and Russians retaking the city multiple times. The Jewish people left on foot, moving west to find safety. Gross saw a tremendous amount of violence during this time. He was temporarily captured and pressed into service by the Austrian army, clearing battlefields and burying bodies. He was barely a teenager at the time. In an oral history with Milton W. Brown, Gross describes how the Austrian government sent cattle trains to transport the hundreds of families to refugee camps. 
Gross became separated from his family and could not find them for several weeks. The family was reunited and found their way to Hungary. Gross and brother Abraham traveled farther, going to Budapest in search of their older brother Pincus, who was in the goldsmithing industry. Gross worked as an apprentice to a jeweler for three years and began drawing in cafes during this time. While in Budapest, Gross witnessed three post-World War I regime changes. In 1919, communist Béla Kuhn led the country for a period during which Gross was granted a highly competitive place at the city's art academy with Béla Utz. He studied at the academy for several months before the government was overthrown by Miklos Horthy, who proceeded to expel the Jews as foreigners. Gross and brother Abraham spent months imprisoned before being sent to the Austrian border. Gross and Abraham then made their way to Kolomea, followed by Vienna. Gross took evening drawing classes at the Kunstgewerbe Schule Wien, or Vienna Art School, while waiting for visas organized by his older brother Naftoli in New York, where he had settled by 1914. Like Chaim, Naftoli was artistically inclined and pursued work as a poet, translator from Yiddish, and journalist for the Jewish Daily Forward. Gross and Abraham departed on April 2, 1921, at Le Havre, France, on the SS La Bourdonnais, and arrived on April 14, 1921, at Ellis Island. They used their mother's last name, Sperber, along with Gross, as their parents were married under Jewish law and not civil. The Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society helped the two brothers locate their brother Naftoli on the Lower East Side. Gross enrolled in classes at the Educational Alliance Art School within a few days of arriving in New York. The Educational Alliance was first established as a Jewish settlement house in Manhattan's Lower East Side in 1889. At the Alliance, Gross quickly befriended other young immigrant artists. His first friend was the Russian-born painter Moses Sawyer, who had come to the U.S. in 1912 with his parents and two brothers, Raphael Sawyer, his twin, and Isaac Sawyer. Gross met Moses on his first day at the Alliance and joined his family for dinner in the Bronx. Chaim, Moses, and Raphael would often go out to the riverbanks of New York City to draw. In addition to his training at the Educational Alliance, Gross studied at the Bose Art Institute of Design with various teachers that included sculptor Elie Nadelman and with Robert Laurent at the Art Students League. He learned direct carving from Laurent. Beginning in 1924, Gross exhibited regularly at the Educational Alliance, the Jewish Art Center, and the Whitney Studio Club. Once he had his own small studio in 1927, Gross began to work primarily in wood. The same year, he began teaching at the Educational Alliance Art School, which became a cornerstone of his life and work for over 50 years. His most well-known student was the sculptor Louise Nebelson, who had been primarily a painter until her class with Gross. This painting, done around 1934, dates from the time Nebelson was Gross's student. In 1932, Gross had his first solo exhibition at Gallery 144, where he showed a selection of 31 sculptures. Sculptor William Zorak wrote the exhibition pamphlet introduction, saying, quote, His work is spirited, youthful, and alive. His figures and animals deal with forms of life around him, sometimes in a light and humorous vein. Americans are inclined to take their art seriously. We should be most grateful for these rare qualities of lightness and play in the work of an artist." End quote. Gross is credited with helping to revive and popularize the direct carving method in the United States. Direct carving describes a subtractive method of making sculpture, beginning with a block of material and not making preparatory models. Gross prioritized keeping the inherent natural properties of the wood or stone along with visible tool marks that show the hand of the artist. Gross carved these works using hand tools, 
most of which can be seen in the preserved studio at LaGuardia Place. While most of his works show universal themes, some reflect on contemporary events. This two-part totemic sculpture owes directly to Gross's reverence for African sculpture. On the left is the Lindbergh family from 1932, and on the right is the conclusion of these events in 1934, the trial and conviction of Bruno Richard Hauptmann. Another abstracted take on current events is Roosevelt and Hoover in a fist fight, made in 1932 during the presidential election. Gross used a flat board, but carved it as a three-dimensional sculpture with a geometric back. Here are some clips from Tree Trunk to Head, a silent black and white film completed in 1938 by director Louis Jacobs that captures Gross making a portrait of his wife, Rini, from beginning to end. The 27-minute film is available in its entirety on the Foundation's website and Vimeo page. While presenting on his work, Gross often showed this film to illustrate his methods. Gross is shown in his 9th Street studio. He begins sketching from the live model, his wife, Rini, capturing her image on paper. Next, he assesses the block of wood, drawing the head in chalk on its surface. Once ready to cut into the material, Gross uses a mallet and gouge, beginning with larger, more aggressive tools before working with more precision. He follows with smoothing the surface with a rasp, riffler, and metal scraper. In footage not shown here, he sands the sculpture, applies a French finish, buffs the surface with steel wool, and applies a coat of wax. He ends with a side-by-side -side comparison of Rini and the completed portrait. Rini Nation was born in 1909 in what was then the Russian Empire, now Lithuania, and immigrated to the U.S. with her family in 1921. She studied literature at Brooklyn College and maintained a strong interest in poetry throughout her life. She and Gross met in 1929, but her parents were concerned about the match due to Gross's apparent lack of prospects. After borrowing the money for the license, they married in December 1932. This painting by Moses Sawyer was given to them in celebration of their wedding. They went on to have two children, son Yehuda and daughter Mimi. In 1933, Gross was awarded a Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation residency at Laurelton Hall, Tiffany's mansion on Long Island. This letter was written by Hayam to Rini during his stay. The letter, which has been translated into English from Yiddish, mentions visits from collectors, a figure in progress, and a finished work he calls Bloomer, now titled Mullen Plant Lamp. He says, quote, I have to also tell you that Mr. Lathrop brought Bloomer back to me. It's too big. It's too high for a lamp, and so the whole thing fell through but maybe he'll think about it again and buy something. It's too bad because $25 can't just walk around." End quote. It is likely that this early experience as an artist in residence helped to shape Gross's vision for future giving to young artists, as later reflected in scholarships and the establishment of the foundation. The neighborhoods where Gross lived and worked in the 1920s and 1930s included the Lower East Side and Greenwich Village. These were vital communities for a variety of reasons. 
The Lower East Side grounded Gross in an environment of other Jewish people, and once Gross moved to his own studio in the village in 1927, followed by a larger studio on 9th Street in 1930, he was surrounded by fellow artists who worked in nearby studios. These included artists such as Willem de Kooning, Raphael Sawyer, and John D. Graham. These artists were also immigrants like Gross, the subject of the foundation's temporary exhibition, Artists and Immigrants. The exhibition includes nearly 100 works by over 50 artists from the foundation's collection. It will be on view through December 23, 2022. A related catalog funded generously by the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation is available for purchase and on the Foundation's website. Based on the shared experience of immigration, Gross formed lasting relationships with these artists and collected their work, the origins of the Foundation's collection. Artists and Immigrants explores the importance of six collective themes in immigrant artists' lives and work their personal histories, thriving communities and neighborhoods such as Greenwich Village and the Lower East Side, arts education, leisure and travel, the rise of social realism and New Deal arts projects during the Great Depression, and the destruction, displacement, and devastation wrought by World War II. Gross, like many artists of his generation, survived the Great Depression as a direct result of the various New Deal arts projects. He joined the Public Works of Art Project in 1933, which later transitioned into the Works Progress Administration. His commissions included projects in Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, and New York. His wife, Rini Gross, reflected in 1998, quote, in fact, it saved us. We would have been dead, but the WPA, which was a great social upheaval, I mean, it was a renaissance." End quote. One of these projects was an entry into a treasury section contest. Gross was awarded $3,000 for his sculpture of an Alaskan mail carrier, completed for the new post office building in Washington, D.C. This small plaster was Gross's submission, and the final sculpture was cast in aluminum from a larger maquette. For the 1939 World's Fair, Gross did a live carving demonstration over a period of four months. The finished ballerina is in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. During World War II, Gross was a member of the City Reserve Patrol, which acted as an auxiliary police force in New York. Rini fundraised and sold war bonds for the U.S. Treasury. Although three of the Gross brothers lived in the U.S. during World War II, not all of Gross's family escaped the Nazis. Gross lost his brother Pincus, as well as his sister Sarah and her family during the Holocaust. The murder of his family members profoundly affected Gross, whose own memories of trauma during World War I resurfaced and intermingled with his newfound grief. This resulted in various changes to his work. He sculpted one of his most powerful works, In Memoriam, My Sister Sarah, Victim of Nazi Atrocities, now in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution's Hirshhorn Museum. There's a stark contrast between the somber, shielding figure of my sister Sarah and Gross's more typical mother and child figures, which he based on wife Rini, Mimi, and Yudi, and are usually exuberant and playful. In 1949, Gross completed a plaster for a proposed Holocaust memorial planned for 83rd Street in Riverside Park. Despite many proposals over the years for larger, more elaborate designs, 
the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial has continued as a plaque and garden. Gross expanded his work in bronze in the late 1950s, traveling several times to Italy to work with the foundries in Rome. He worked in a variety of scales, but the freedom and flexibility of bronze casting allowed him to work on a monumental scale. Building up the material on a metal armature and then using rasps and other tools to remove and smooth the plaster. The effect is lighter visually, as pieces are made in an additive, not subtractive manner. Gross also worked in clay, as seen in this photo of him working in his Grand Street studio, which he used simultaneously to his studio on LaGuardia Place. In 1965, he accepted a commission from Temple Charest de Fila to create a monumental multi-part bronze sculpture showing the six days of creation. Each panel was cast in bronze and is just under nine feet tall. The installation can still be seen in the sanctuary at 79th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan. In 1969, he took on the project of depicting the Ten Commandments for the International Synagogue at John F. Kennedy Airport. Like Six Days of Creation, the large bronze relief panels were designed to hang on the walls of the sanctuary. The project was completed in 1971. Gross continued to work until his death in 1991. Although the plaster for the family was completed in 1979, the bronze sculpture was not placed in its current location in Bleecker Street Playground at 11th Street until after his death. The sculpture continues to be a favorite. Many of Gross's works can be seen in and around New York, including bronzes at Pace University, Fordham University, the New School, and City College. Important wood sculptures are on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Brooklyn Museum. Gross's early experiences shaped his philanthropic vision. He taught for the entirety of his career, not only as a means to earn extra income, but also as a way to connect with younger artists and pass along his deep knowledge of sculpture and wood carving. His focus on education led to the publication of two books, The Technique of Wood Sculpture in 1957 and Sculpture in Progress in 1972, which is on the subject of modeling and plaster for bronze casting. The Grosses contributed to various scholarship funds, including at the Educational Alliance Art School and Yeshiva University. Rini fundraised during the Spanish Civil War, sold war bonds during World War II, and later turned to support of Israel. The foundation was first established in 1974 with donations from friends and supporters of Gross, including Joseph Hirschhorn and Roy Neuberger. The altruistic intent behind many of the Gross's actions led them to incorporate the foundation as a 501c3 not-for-profit organization in 1989. Rini opened the doors to Gross's studio and the second floor exhibition space in 1994. She continued to live at LaGuardia Place until her death in 2005, occupying the top two floors. In 2009, the foundation began including the third floor living spaces on tours and during programs. This space is significant for its installation of American, African, European, Oceanic, Pre-Columbian, and decorative arts from the Gross's historic collection. The foundation also maintains an archive and Gross's extensive art history library. Rini's commitment to their shared vision after Heim Gross's passing 
has created a vibrant organization that continues to further their legacies through high quality research, exhibitions, and educational activities around the home, studio, and art collections for audiences in New York City and beyond. Thank you so much, Sasha. I had myself muted not to disturb you. Thank you so much. What a what a tour. Um, I, I think there's so many questions already, but now um, we are going from one highlight to the next as I'm uh, welcoming Mimi into the conversation. Uh, hi, Mimi. And I'm really, really excited that you will share now your experiences and talk to Sasha about what it me what it meant to grow up as Mimi grows. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question isn't it <laughs> um sure. i'm gonna i'm gonna share a powerpoint um where we're gonna look at some images um and we're gonna start with one of my favorite photos um by marion palfi and Mimi, could you talk a little bit about this particular photograph and a little bit about your early childhood? Well, I don't have too much memory of that age, mm -hmm. but it's during uh, World War II. My father uh, was a, a substitute policeman. He tried to enlist, but because he had a family, he was given a city job, which was needed as well. And there are a few pictures of him in this uniform. And the only anecdote that my brother always tells is that a, a, there was a robbery and somebody came up to him, help, help, there's a thief and my father ran the other way. That's the only anecdote we have. As for the, the family together, I think it's an unusual picture because I, I mean, I have no memory of this. The, the little sculpture in the back, I think it's by Andre Masson. Is that right? Yes, yes, that is Mimi. And next to it is also the Mullen plant lamp, which was one of the works that uh, Heim Gross did during his Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation residency. So it's interesting that he had tried to, to sell it, had it returned and then just kept it um, for his own home, which I think is wonderful. Um, and this particular artist is also interesting, the photographer. Um, if no one's um, heard of her, just to say a few sentences about her life. Um, she was from Germany um, and was essentially forced to uh, escape first to Amsterdam um, and then the United States um, in 1940. Uh, so she did a lot of social documentary photographs in the US and did a lot of sort of multi-part projects, um, which this uh, photograph was part of. I think she was living in our apartment at the time. Is there some other photographs by her? And I remember somebody living there. That's really interesting. It's before my parents moved around the corner to the house where I grew up, which was 105th Street near Central Park. This was uh, before the move, so I'm under I'm under four years old, you know, three, probably three or two and a half. So they were in an, so they were in an apartment during this time before they moved to the larger home. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Very interesting. Um, and then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of Hyam's most important works. Uh, one of which is uh, the Lindbergh family and the Hotman trial. Uh, this is, these are a little bit unusual in that they sort of deviate from a lot of his regular work, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about his work, his style, the kind of materials he used, um, you know, and how you saw him working throughout your life. Well, this was done long before I was born. And I do remember the piece, it was always in his studio with a homemade double bass. He did experiment with abstract work, but I don't know what influenced him to return to a 
more literal figuration. I have no idea. I do know that the WPA saved his life and therefore our lives. And that was at that period. He was from the very beginning of the WPA until it ended in the 40s. He was part of it. And then here's another um, very important work uh, carved in cocoa bolo wood by Heim Gross um, in memoriam my sister Sarah, victim of Nazi atrocities. When was, um, I was just curious to talk about a little bit, um, you know, how the loss of so many of his family members affected him. Um, you know, we see it in his work, but how, how was it, you know, being his, his daughter? Um, well, this is something that Rachel would be more familiar with. He never talked about it till very late in his life. If that's an answer. Maybe Rachel has a call. Well, what did he say late in life about it? About his sister, he never talked about her. Never. Yeah. And maybe actually, I think that's a very, very common behavior that many, uh, many people kept these painful emotional experiences and memories. Um, just locked up inside and never, never shared it really with their with their children and not even with spouses in many cases. So he, he uh, did talk about the pogroms, which is before World War II, when he was a little child still at home, and he uh, described the pogroms that came and attacked his mother and said that her her head was cut across the front and that. She always had stitches and that his father was protecting her from getting raped and the soldier had a sword and cut his fingers with the sword. And then they took his mother in a wheelbarrow to a relative to help them, I guess, to get some stitches. But he, he, he did talk about that in detail, you know, going with the wagon up a hill you know, it didn't really describe the village that much, but it was visual the way he did describe it. Yeah. Mimi, I was curious to know a little bit more about uh, the work that Chaim did with his brother Naftoli, because clearly there was a strong um, artistic bent in the family that has now continued you know, in your generation as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, this this project, Tales and Parables? I don't know anything about it. Well, I how, mean, you know, I, I hope it's been translated, but I've never seen a translation. Have you? No, I don't have a copy of a translation. We only have it in Yiddish in our archives. But is there one? I don't know. We'll have to look it up. Uh, let's see. And this is a drawing by Mimi Gross that's in the Foundation's collection. It's called My Three Fathers. And in this drawing, we have uh, David Berliuk, Moses Sawyer, and Haim Gross. And there's also writing at the top by Berliuk as well. Um, tell me a little bit about your uh, connections with these other artists. Obviously, to, to make something like My Three Fathers, it must have been a very close relationship. Well, you can see my father has his apron on, which means it was done in the studio, and they're just sitting around talking. And I, I you know, I draw everything all the time. But the fact that Brilliuk wrote all over it really gave it a special quality. He was, he was, they were mentors, you know, they encouraged me and they were great friends with Hyam. Brilliuk was actually a giant and he always had a, an earring and a class eye. He was a very unusual looking man. And Moses was one of my father's dearest friends throughout their life. It's Raphael Sawyer who was 
even more of an influence for me. But they both painted me, you know, I just knew them all my life till they died. And they were also both immigrants as well. They um, both both on this drawing and he framed it. It says 1963 on it. <laughs> so I was uh, 22 years old. Wonderful. And here, um, so here are a few images of works that we have at our Artists and Immigrants show. That's the exhibition that's on our second floor currently. Um, so this is the one of my favorite pieces um, by Moses Sawyer. It's an oil painting, the portrait of your parents um, in the Ninth Street studio. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful painting. <laughs> One of the other fun aspects about it is not only does it show this, you know, closeness that they had physically and also, you know, Rini's in the studio, but there's also um, works from the collection that are still in the collection depicted on the wall behind. So there's a portrait of Haim carving by Raphael Sawyer that's in the painting itself. If I could just briefly break in, Mimi, you said Rachel Sawyer was a uh, much stronger influence on you than uh than the men uh, uh in what way was was she in i meant I, I just although i knew them all my life and they were very important it's just Rafael i spent a lot more time with he mm -hmm. painted many many times and he was always encouraging me about my own work mm -hmm. it's not that the others didn't i don't mean to to mean that but I right, just right, right. spent more time with Raphael. Mm -hmm. And he liked younger people in a way that he liked having them around his studio. And I have many friends who pose for him as well. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And then uh, here's another oil painting. This is uh, Louise Nevelson's The Queen. Uh, we mentioned it in the video, but uh, I was curious, maybe did you um, get to meet Nevelson through your father? Yes, she was also a lifetime family friend, as well as her sister, Lily and Mildwaff and, and her family, who were also very good friends. And she too was fantastically uh, encouraging to me as as a young woman artist, you know, and said to just forget everybody, just forge ahead. To use a much more expletive word, <laughs> she was a very bold person, and the work of the painting really holds up. It's wonderful, and it's great. There's a, a super interest in her sculpture now. She lived around the corner from when I lived in Little Italy on Mulberry Street. She was around the corner on Mott Street. So we saw each other fairly often. Did you visit her studio or did she visit you at your studio? Just once. <laughs> the, uh, downstairs, there were some harpsichord makers and she knew them quite well. They would have harpsichord concerts. And so she would come to that. So that you were about to show this brilliant, this is a great painting. This is by David Bullock. And it's it's hard to tell on the screen, but it's actually very, and Nevelson too, very three-dimensional and, and textured, um, very thick paint layer. Uh, and Berliuk was very interesting because he had a whole life and career um, in Russia. A lot of the immigrants that we were looking at came as children, young adults, um, but he had this whole other life um, before immigrating and he lived in Japan for a year um, before coming uh, to the US. And uh, so we have a few works by him in the collection um, and also some of his writings. He was a very interesting writer as well. 
we had a newspaper that he did with his wife. I don't know if you have copies of it, but it was wonderful. It was very vernacular. Is that Color and Rhyme? Color and Rhyme, yes. Mm -hmm. They wrote everything. It was like four pages. Here's another painting from the show. This is by Abraham Walkowitz um, of the circus. We have so many circus performers um, by Heim Gross in the collection. So it's nice to see that his, you know, there are other artists interested in the circus as well. Well, Walkowitz had a great career early in his life, but later he was eclipsed and he became blind and sort of forgotten. And there's interest in his work today. There is, yeah. This this oil on canvas painting is pretty large, but we also have a number of these really beautiful small watercolors as well. So this one's very early, 1908, um, showing Orchard Street. Um, and this is by Ilya Shore. And I know Ilya and Resha are another sort of power couple artists um, that your parents were close to. Uh, and their, right? daughter, their daughter Mira is a wonderful artist and writer mm -hmm. who I thought Rachel would be interested to interview. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> and speaking of um, other people uh, who've been on this, this series of programs, um, Ben Zion, who's another artist who comes into the collection quite often. Uh, you had done a program um, with Tabita and Ori, I believe, earlier this year, which was fantastic. Um, but I just wanted to mention that um, Ben Zion um, is- It's a character. Mm -hmm. And his house, his house is amazing. His collection and his house, totally amazing. He collected much different kind of items than your father, though. Your father was, yeah. <laughs> and I think that that's what makes it interesting, actually. I, I uh, very much agree with Mimi to see, um, and and I find I find these the artists' houses that are maintained as artists' houses uh, really captivating uh, because they capture also the the personality of the the artist and uh, give a glimpse into the private life, which is uh, you know which you can't cre create in any other in any other way. So um, yeah, thank you for saying that, Mimi. <laughs> My father's interest in African art was really kind of contagious, and he would he would basically get every single person he knew interested in African art and like. <laughs> Was he like that with any other areas of art or just African art? Well, with contemporary art, he encouraged people to buy work by other artists and he was very generous that way. He would take them to studios and make collections, help them make collections. That's incredible. Um, it was unusual that way. Yeah. This is a great painting too. <laughs> His yeah, the, the, daughter was of Salt Bellows, many wives. This is another um, artist that's in the show, uh, Oluis Guglielmi, who was um, of Italian parentage, but actually born in Egypt and immigrated to the US. And uh, this was sort of a commentary on what was going on in the 30s, um, the Great Depression, and the painting is called The Hungry, and it's actually a tempera on board um, piece. We do oh, have a lot of- mm -hmm. Yeah, as opposed to being oil. I mean, actually had it conserved recently, so it looks very, beautiful and bright at the moment. Uh, but there's a lot of detail because it is tempera, which makes it quite um, interesting. Rich and rich. Mm -hmm. And for a contrast. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you knew Willem de Kooning as well, right? Yes. I'm, I mean, I met him several times, yes. 
was when it like did, the uh, artist that you showed earlier who I knew all my life? Mm -hmm. But when did uh, your father first meet him? During the WPA, they were neighbors and they were both on the, on the uh, program. And then years later, they had a reunion in Rome, which they saw each other frequently in Rome. And that's how this drawing is from that time. Now, I had met him separately through Rudy Burkhardt mm. and then Saul Steinberg visited him with Saul Steinberg in uh, Amagansett. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And I believe that uh, de Kooning was also kicked off of the WPA um, as being uh, an alien because he had come here um, without papers. He was a stowaway. <laughs> yeah. I actually um, want to encourage everyone, we have a few more minutes to ask questions. So uh, um, the first question is by Catherine. Uh, would Mimi or Sasha say more about Chaim and his brother Naftali Gross? Naftali was a very well-known Yiddish poet involved with modernist literary movements among Yiddish-speaking immigrant writers in New York. Mimi, what do you remember about Naftali? I, I just want to say that he wrote for the Jewish Daily Forward for 45 years. He had a byline of, of, of parables and proverbs. And um, my memory of Naftali is that he always scolded me for not learning Yiddish. And of course, he was, I was a child when he, he still a young person when he died. But he was tall and imposing with huge black eyebrows and piercing eyes and of uh, actually very warm and even though he was so imposing and um i have affectionate memory of him i remember going to his apartment it's the first place i saw stacks and stacks of papers and books sideways just <laughs> on tables piled up high <laughs> And his son, Gershon, I was close to for many years. He um, immigrated to Israel mm -hmm. and you know, the rest of his life and had his family there. Started a kibbutz that has my father's sculpture. And my mother and daughter went to visit them in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My mother took my daughter Saskia on a, the Chaim Gross trip to Israel. They went to all the places where his work was. How old was your daughter at the time? She's, uh, she's in college. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, is, so Catherine is also asking, is the WP a post office sculpture still exhibited somewhere? Yeah, my brother went to see it. It's in Washington in the post office building, and it's apparently in an office, and one can request to see it. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say the, the current name of the building is the uh, William Clinton uh, post office building, but it changes names regularly. Uh, there's a really good website um, that kind of covers all of the WPA New Arts, New Deal Arts um, locations, which is really helpful for that. And uh, because uh, it's hard to access, I haven't seen it in person, but I do recommend people look into it if possible. And Haim wasn't the only one who had made these different sculptures. There's also ones by Alexander Calder and, and quite a few other artists um, who are very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely something to, to revisit as. Oh, it's a subject that really needs to be covered. It's been very under, under not written about that much. It's known by anyone studying American art history, but it's, it's basically underknown. Mm -hmm. Artists underappreciated. Right, right. And from what I know, also um, many of the artworks weren't really 
um, placed well and aren't being, yeah, as you said, aren't being well, uh, the way not they should long be. Ago, there was a, a, a wonderful friend of my father's called Margo Lees, who had been an assistant to Diego Rivera when he worked in New York. He did several murals in a hospital on the east side that had been painted over more than once, several times, including a, a partition wall. And a, about 10 years ago, it was restored and they took all the paint away and found the murals, which were in medium, terrible shape, but they restored them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, and what a wonderful way to, to support artists during a recession, right? I mean- Yeah, we could do that uh, now. But yes, quick. yes, exactly. I, I very much agree. It wasn't so, a visual artist, it was everybody. It was writers, theater people and photographers. You know, the great Let Us Now Praise Famous Men was made during the WPA. Yeah. For yeah. example. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so Paula is us, uh, saying, thank you, this was wonderful. I'm interested in the idea of direct sculpture. You said Haim used no preparatory drawings, but uh, with the wood, he did make a drawing on the wood uh, and drew on the wood in chalk. Can you? That's true, he made many preparatory drawings. Okay. Yes, uh, just to clarify. <laughs> Any preparatory drawings and including different points of view of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he didn't do preparatory models. So a lot of times when you're casting in bronze, and you'll you'll see this even in Hyam's work, uh, for like example, the Alaskan mail carrier, he did the small plaster maquette that was submitted and then eventually did a, a four-foot high version that was the one cast in aluminum. But Generally for his wooden or stone sculptures, he would not have been making a small model in, in clay or plaster. He would have just used those uh, drawings on paper to transition to drawing on the wood. He said, that, of... sorry. Go ahead. he said that he needed somebody else to help him point, you know, to enlarge work. Um, he didn't have any assistance to point it up that he knew how to do it. And he specified Rodin where you see um, cast where you can see the places where the pointer left marks for enlarging a piece that you could at himself. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. just a typical note. <laughs> well, it's also really interesting that he didn't use assistance. Um, first, I mean, when you think about how prolific he was uh, throughout his career and also the fact that he was dealing with these, you know, 300 pound logs quite often. I mean, that that must have been incredible to see as well. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, so Ruth Allen is asking, I have a Chaim Gross menorah made from stone. Um, and the menorah appears to be crying. Um, <laughs> so she wants to get in touch with you and I think we'll we'll send out in the follow-up email I will send out a contact information so you can be like for cases like that you can be um, you can be contacted also Svetlana asks uh, whether you need volunteer translators so um, yes also, yes we'll, <laughs> we'll send out uh, we'll send out a contact um, email to um, directly approach you about these things. Um, yeah, thank you so much. The, <laughs> we never have enough time, but this was so full of, of information. And I'm, I'm actually, thank you so, so much for this uh, really comprehensive uh, introduction into, into uh, Chaim Gross's work and, um, I can um, actually recommend only to everybody who lives in the New York area or is planning a visit there here, uh, I strongly recommend to uh, visit the René and Chaim Gross Foundation. Um, it is a magical place in which um, I find the artist's energy is uh, very still, very present still. So it's, it's uh, 
uh, it's really worth a visit. And um, uh, thank you so much uh, again to Mimi and Sasha for your time and for introducing us. And I hope that all our listeners of today's event are uh, tuning in again on Monday uh, when for the Zoom event from generation to generation, the upbringing and art of Mimi goes when we're talking much more about Mimi herself and her art, which, uh, which uh, I'm very much looking forward to. And uh, she will be speaking with Ori, uh, Georgetown University Professor Ori Scholte. So. Um, something to look forward to. Um, thank you so much. And uh, thank, you, thank you, Sasha. Thank you. All best wishes. That show. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank oh. you, Rachel. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.